International News Now. Over the span of just one month since the end of August, uh, nearly 500,000 members of an ethnic minority, uh, the uh, Rohingya, uh, and this is out of a total of about one million who reside in Myanmar, have fled persecution at the hands of the military in that country. And uh, we're going to start with a news clip from PBS NewsHour again on the Rohingya refugee crisis, and then we're going to talk a bit about the politics surrounding this. So let's go ahead and roll that clip now. In the past few weeks, the crackdown on Muslim Rohingyas in Myanmar has triggered a mass exodus. The United Nations estimates that 390,000 Rohingyas have fled to neighboring Bangladesh after suffering what they say are violent attacks by government troops and others. The fighting is driven in part by an ongoing years-long conflict between Rohingya militants and the government of Myanmar. NewsHour special correspondent Tanya Rashid has this report from along the Bangladesh-Myanmar border. It's a mass exodus with no end in sight. They can barely walk or speak, desperate and starving. Close to half a million Rohingya Muslims have fled to Bangladesh in the past three weeks. Escaping violent attacks carried out by Myanmar troops and Buddhist vigilantes. The conflict was triggered by the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, known as ARSA, an insurgency group. Its fighters attacked dozens of police and army posts across Myanmar's Rakhine state on August 25th. Funded partially by private donors in Saudi Arabia, ARSA accuses the Myanmar military of acts of extreme violence against Rohingya Muslims. In response, the Myanmar military launched a major counterinsurgency campaign. The UN human rights chief has called it a textbook ethnic cleansing. The Rohingya are a stateless Muslim minority group who have faced persecution in Myanmar. They are denied citizenship and freedom of movement. For the past three weeks, Myanmar's de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, has come under immense international criticism for remaining silent in the face of this violence. Last week, the Nobel laureate canceled her trip to the UN General Assembly in New York to deal with the Rohingya crisis. The Rohingyas arrive in Bangladesh, hungry and tired and into utter chaos. Every scrap of land is being used by the refugees to make shelter. Since many of the refugee camps are overcrowded and such a large influx of people are coming in in such a short period of time, people are doing what they can to make space for a home. Hasina Begum fled her home five days ago. The Buddhists burnt my village to ash. They shot my father dead in front of me. I traveled here through the forest with my family. She told me she was helped by two armed men from Arsa as she crossed the border. The Buddhists were killing us one by one before the August 25th attacks. That's why Arsa launched their attacks, because they are killing us. We couldn't take it anymore. That's why we are fighting. Arsa is fighting for all the Rohingyas in Myanmar. All right. So let's give a little background here. The Rohingya are an ethnic minority in Myanmar, and they are primarily a, a, a Muslim minority, while Myanmar is a majority Buddhist country. Uh, besides religious differences, the Rohingya speak their own language and have a different appearance uh, than the majority Burmese. Uh, and so they're easily sort of uh, singled out. The group is concentrated as well geographically in the Rakhine state within Myanmar, which is on the coast near the border of Bangladesh. Now, the current refugee crisis has both long-term and short-term roots. The Rohingya have been persecuted in Myanmar for many years. They were denied citizenship when Burma uh, gained independence from Great Britain in the 1940s, and then in another citizenship law passed in 1982, uh, this uh, Law reinforced their status as a stateless people, people that don't have citizenship in any country, uh, because the military dictatorship that ruled uh, the country at the time did not recognize Rohingya as one of the 135 officially recognized ethnic groups of the country. And so without citizenship, the Rohingya could not 
gain any education, they didn't have access to health care, they couldn't find gainful employment, and so they were segregated from the rest of uh, society. And so this has been a long-term uh, problem. They've been uh, persecuted and uh, marginalized uh, for, for many uh, decades. However, more immediately, the catalyst of the recent mass exodus in which hundreds of thousands of Rohingya have fled the country is a direct result of several attacks on police and army posts in Myanmar by a group known as the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, or ARSA. And it should be noted that this group, uh, shortly after these attacks, declared a unilateral ceasefire in September uh, that the government of uh, Myanmar rejected because it uh, would not negotiate with what it deemed to be terrorists. In reaction to these attacks by ARSA, According to eyewitness accounts and satellite images and the like, the military and armed civilians from the Buddhist majority uh, engaged in a brutal campaign to expel the Rohingya from Myanmar, threatening to kill them if they did not leave. And this led the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights to describe the actions of the military and these uh, civilian militias as a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is trying to to drive out whole ethnic groups from a country. Uh, satellite images, uh, as well as other evidence, tells a story of whole villages being burned down as, and also there's reports of mass rapes and, and uh, indiscriminate killings uh, during this campaign. Uh, there are also reports that the uh, military of Myanmar planted landmines uh, along the border with Bangladesh, uh, presumably to kill those fleeing uh, from their persecution. So uh, most of these refugees are children, uh, as well as women and the elderly. Now, what has made this tragedy even more difficult to accept uh, in, on the international uh, scene is the role of Myanmar's de facto leader, uh, and this is Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung San Suu Kyi was a, uh, celebrated by President Obama uh, and other Western leaders. She was held in the house arrest for decades, and she continually um, voiced opposition to the uh, military dictatorship of her country. She uh, stood up for human rights during the, her house arrest, and she, uh, once she was released, once the military tried to reach out and, and end some of the sanctions that were uh, damaging their country, she was released and, and she helped to usher in a democratic transition uh, of the country, a partial democratic transition in which her party swept uh, the election in, in 2015. Uh, now, the military still holds a lot of control here and that's part of the problem that uh, has uh, contributed to this crisis. But on the issue of persecution of the Rohingya, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has been silent and has consequently come under a lot of intense international condemnation. Politically, even though she commands great political and moral influence, she doesn't control the military. Uh, the military wrote a constitution as it was devolving some power that reserves a great deal of influence in its own hands. And thus any strong move by uh, her, even though she's the de facto leader of the country, to condemn or rein in uh, the military could very well get her removed. They could um, change the government. They're, and so she is uh, quite constrained by the military itself. And so some commentators have given her a bit of a... a some understanding about the, the difficult situation she's in. However, uh, even with these constraints, uh, she does hold great moral authority and she could have spoken out against the atrocities committed against the Rohingya uh, and the military probably would have been quite uh, constrained from moving against her because of what the international community would have done in response. Instead, she has remained silent. Uh, and why that's the case has been a source of, of uh, discussion here. But part of it is not just because she still 
under the control and the country still under the control of the uh, military. Part of it is that she uh, has been silent because the Rohingya are a very unpopular minority uh, among the Buddhist majority. And she is, by her own admission, a politician. And as such, she courts votes and thus has avoided uh, taking an unpopular position against uh, the opinion of the majority of her country. So that's the situation we're in. There hasn't been a lot of action or statements from the Trump administration or, or um, uh, much uh, in the name of, there, most of the criticism has come from international organizations and human rights uh, advocates who have decried this uh, problem. But there's a lot of problems with this situation. Uh, other countries in the region, uh, they, they don't want these uh, migrants either. They, they've been trying to keep them from um, coming into their countries because of the potential threat they pose and because of the strain that thousands and thousands of people coming across the border present. And so this is, this is a humanitarian crisis uh, happening in front of our eyes. Yeah, and so one of the things that the video talked about that we didn't show you, the interviewer was interviewing local um, Bangladeshi citizens who live in areas where the Rohingya have have moved to, right? Half uh, half a million people, and talking to a landowner was like, they've taken over my property. There are insurgents that live among the refugees. The insurgents are attacking local authorities. And the larger issue and challenge here is anytime you have a significant population movement, it changes the political reality on the ground. In this case, right, you have half a million refugees fleeing with nothing. They're starving. Um, they don't have any assets. They're not protected. Um, they can't get health care. And they're moving into a state that doesn't have a lot of capacity right. to, in a sense, shoulder the basic public goods problems created, get them fed, um, get them shelter, sanitation. Uh, sanitation, protection, and the like. And what does this then do? It creates a huge demand and burden on the larger international community to support. And so we're seeing something similar to that happened in Syria. Right. Um, with the Syrian civil war, when you've got millions of people moving across the borders, the same thing is going on here. And the larger point is that what happens in Burma, Myanmar, is spilling over and is altering politics on the ground in the neighboring countries and potentially creating a larger international challenge. Right.